Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar's five ways to optimize your LiDAR data. We have a big team of people here working behind the scenes to bring you some amazing content. So we really hope you're going to enjoy our webinar today. And with that, I think we can um, probably turn our webcam now and I'm going to pass it over to Kaylin. Can everyone see my screen all right? Yes, that's look good. Okay. So I'm going to be presenting with Richard Jovita, and I don't know if you guys want to say hello. Hello. Morning. On the agenda for today, we're going to go over a brief LiDAR overview, and then we're going to go through five uh, ways to improve your LiDAR workflow. So everything from translating between formats um, to integrating with 3D city modeling, and hopefully if there's time left over, we'll have uh, Q&A. The LiDAR overview. <clears throat> what is LiDAR? LiDAR stands for light detection and ranging, and it's typically used to collect and create point clouds that uh, represent or describe a surface. FME supports quite a, a few point cloud formats, E57, POD, LAS, uh, XYZ. Could probably name off the whole alphabet there, but if you did want a full list, we have a format matrix on our website, which you can go and filter by point clouds and LiDAR, and you should see them all pop up. So why do we use point clouds? We use point clouds because they produce amazing 3D visualizations, and they're, they can really accurately represent the real world. And when we're working with spatial data, that's kind of something we, we are looking for. The problem with point clouds is they can be huge um, and they're kind of complicated if you're not uh, if you're new to working with them. Some people claim that they're easier to work with than rasters, but um, starting new can always be difficult. They take up a lot of storage, they can be computationally expensive, um, and uh, there can be limitations. So whether that's your computer or storage or knowledge. Most of our demonstrations will be uh, done in the FME desktop, but I think Richard will be automating an example with FME server a little bit later on. What can you do with FME in your point clouds? So you can create surface models, you can filter, reduce noise, clip to a specific region. There's a ton of things that we can do with our point clouds in FME, and today we'll be going over a lot of these examples. The first step in improving your LiDAR workflows is to simplify the process of transforming and integrating point clouds using FME's point cloud transformers. <clears throat> so we have about 24 or 25 point cloud transformers, not including the ones on the FME hub. Um, if you can see, this attribute manager has a rank of two, and we did try and choose the most popular, uh, popularly ranked point cloud transformers to showcase. Uh, we have a link to our FME transformer gallery, which I think we can link out now. And if you filter by LiDAR and point clouds, you should see the full set there. Jumping into the transformers, the point cloud property extractor was one of the highly ranked ones that we saw, so we decided to showcase it. Um, this extracts the properties of a point cloud feature and exposes them as an attribute. So here I'm retrieving properties of a point cloud's XYZ components, and then you can see nice uh, Workbench nicely formats these into uh, attributes, which we can work with in a more tabular manner now. The second one is the point cloud combiner. Um, this transformer name is pretty intuitive. It combines multiple geometries into a single point cloud. Here I'm combining two input point clouds to create one point cloud data set, but you can also combine this with other formats, so like SketchUp models if you had them. Um, and I didn't add a screenshot of the parameters because everything in this parameter was left as default to get these results. The point cloud thinner, this uh, workflow piggybacks off the last one a little bit. All I did was add a point cloud thinner before the combiner. Um, and what this does is that you, it reduces data volume by identifying a set or interval of points to keep, and then it discards the rest. So I chose an interval of 100 here. Um, it's pretty drastic, but this way you can kind of see the results. So you can see what it's doing. And this brings us to our second step in improving your uh, LiDAR workflows. So to prepare your data. Although we have a ton of point cloud specific transformers, we also have a lot of other transformers that are point cloud compatible. Um, the Tyler, if you're working with really large data sets, the Clipper, if you have uh, Z values, you can do qubit clipping. The Tester, Attribute Managers, or Creators, Reprojectors all work with point clouds. Um, 
And so in this screenshot here, all I've done is used a color setter to overlay a geotiff onto the point cloud just to kind of make it look a little bit prettier. And then I downloaded a building shape file for the same extent and clipped the buildings from the original point cloud, which is what you're seeing here. And I think from here, I'm gonna pass this to Richard. So we're gonna uh, create and automate surface models here. And this uh, webinar portion is just gonna be talking about how to get yourself up and running if you're new to FME, if you are new to point clouds, and talk a little bit about FME server. So I wanted to go through uh, how FME interprets the point clouds. Um, FME interprets everything as one feature. This allows us to process it very quickly, but you still have your components on your point cloud. So each individual component will have its own values, and then you'll have your attributes for the entire point cloud. You can kind of see this here in the properties dialog of FME Inspector. You can see the individual components down here, and then you can see the component values. And you can alter those as needed if you want, or you can add in additional attributes, which can be turned into components if you want to put a component across uh, the range or a subset of the points. So when we're creating workflows, it, we're working with really big data sets generally. So we want to find out a best way to uh, either thin it, clip it, tile it, bring it down that size so that we can work with it manageably in our workflow. And presumably your data, since it's all gonna have the, the same schema, we should be able to work on a small subset and work through each transformer and then apply it to the greater um, set. This is just gonna speed up the process of us designing these workflows. So it, it's always a good idea to have it in there. And then finally, when you're processing it, you might want to chunk up the workflow, especially with something like the Tyler, where you can head off different sections at different times or even on um, different uh, workspaces so that you can really utilize your full suite. So we'll jump in here with the demo. So this is the workspace, and, and I wanted to really highlight how simple creating a digital elevation model is. We've got some points here, and I, I'm going to go talk about this later, but essentially we're just grabbing some JSON points that will be integrated with FME server. So it's just an area that we're clipping the point cloud by. We're also going to clip a raster. And, and then the meat of this is we have a surface modeler, and that's what's going to create our digital terrain models. And then I also have an example down here, and we're going to zoom in a little bit, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a second, um, if you don't have classified data. So We'll run it through. And uh, we get out a digital train model where we applied the GeoTIFF on top of it. So uh, it produces this uh, fairly nice model. Um, Jovita is going to go into more detail about how to get those buildings to look perfect based upon um, the perimeters, the building outlines. We've got your digital train model with your classified data. And then if you have unclassified data, we're gonna go through a little bit uh, of a method to, to pull out the bottom um, and the floor, the, the, the ground surface of your data. So creating a digital elevation model is as simple as adding one of these transformers. We have the TIN generator and DEM generator, but we've also got the surface model, which modeler, which does a bunch of things. Um, the nice thing about it is you're not going to be using all those factories and all those processes if you don't have anything connected. So it's not going to take a lot of more resources, but it's all there in one. Uh, the main thing you want to be concerned with with the surface modeler is the tolerance, um, and that surface tolerance is based upon how dense your point cloud is, and you can play with that and tweak it depending on your data. Uh, and then in the other side, applying the raster, you have the appearance setter. And this is another, just drop it into the workspace. Um, it should come up with pretty much all the settings we want. The only things to be aware of is that we want to set the appearance on the front side of our little triangles that we have for our tin surface. And then we want to uh, drop the, the texture mapping top down geo referenced. Uh, and then the digital surface model, which is 
basically the same thing that we had before, the entire point cloud, but we're, we're taking away all the vegetation, all the buildings. And the key to this is the point cloud uh, filter. So we can filter out everything that we don't want, or we can filter out um, multiple things, or you could just have vegetation or vegetation and buildings. And this allows us to dig down into, into what we want and only show the things that we want for our model. And then non-classified data. If you Most data will be classified when you get it, but if you do get data that isn't classified, you can use the point cloud expression evaluator to run expressions that would fit your data. So for this one, we're basically gonna compare it to itself and try to find the base or the surface model of it. Um, and you can see it's only three transformers here to be able to do that. So there, there's a lot of different ways which you can interact with your data and pull out what you want manually. And then there's all these nice tools like the last tools where you can do it a little more quickly um, and, and potentially with uh, more accuracy. But uh, Kaylin will talk about some of these transformers later on. So for the second part of the demo, I just want to show FME server. So with FME server, I had um, the geometry picker on the front end of that workflow, and that just popped in the JSON. And when I put it up to FME server, I get the choice of a little dialogue. So if I have a really big point cloud, I can cut out a small area of it. I can zoom in, clear it, create a section of it. Um, and then I've got options down here. Do I want a digital train model or, or a digital elevation model? And we'll run it. And this will bring the data right back to the user. The other nice thing about FME server is typically we have quite a few engines on there. So if your workflow is really big, there are ways where you can read in specific tiles and then have those process on individual engines. So each individual engine will process a workflow. So if each one is running just a small subset of that point cloud, you can process things a lot quicker. So now we've got the data download URL, just download it, and then you can open the file and you get your point cloud, um, digital elevation model from the point cloud. So this is a nice way where you can take um, your workflows and, and make them quicker or self-serve, or you can speed them up with dynamic engines. You can automate them. Um, LiDAR, presumably your data sources would be very similar coming in. So you should be able to apply the process to many things and you can take it out of your hands uh, and you can focus on building or doing more interesting things with your data if you have a flow that you need to do on a regular basis. Uh, the big FME server uh, installations, or if you have, again, multiple engines or lots of RAM, it can really help speed up these big processes. And that's it from me. And we're going to pass it back off to Jovita now, who's going to look at the city modeling. Thank you, Richard. So our next part is looking at visualizing solutions by using LiDAR for 3D city modeling. We're going to build upon what Kaylin and Richard talked about, and we're going to put those elements together to make a slightly larger workflow that creates that kind of 3D visualization as an output. The goal of this workspace is to integrate data from a variety of sources in order to create an enriched visualization of the city in 3D. And that can then be used to inform decision making in uses like planning and development. And we're going to overcome all these obstacles of different various data sources and formats by using FME to extract the information we need from LiDAR and create that visualization. So before I get actually into the workspace, I want to talk about my inputs because I've got quite a few here. First off, I'll be using AutoCAD DWG, and those are the pink outlines that you can see of the building polygons. I'll be using point cloud, the last format, and this is a section of the city of Vancouver. So a lot of this data is from city of Vancouver's open data portal. And this is just a small section of the city of Vancouver um, around the Granville Island area, if anyone is familiar with it. And that's just the Fraser River, I believe, or False Creek, right in the middle there. 
I've got map info as well for my park polygons. And that'll be because I'll be working with a tree model, a 3D SketchUp tree model. And so I just wanted to limit to a certain park just for rendering for this demo. And then finally, I've got four GeoTIFF images or ortho images, and they're just tiled images that I've selected for this area. So it's a little bit larger and I'll be clipping that down. And then the 3D SketchUp model that I mentioned of that tree that we'll be replacing points with. And finally, a texture image for the walls. So this isn't exactly representative of all of Vancouver's buildings, but if you imagined every building as, if anyone's familiar with UBC's buildings, Ponderosa, then the whole city is now Ponderosa buildings. So I've got three goals for this workspace. The first is to create 3D buildings using the point cloud and the DWG outlines, where we're going to extrude the outlines to the height of the building using that LiDAR information. Next, I want to add PNG and ortho photos, so the geotiffs, as textures to the 3D models. We'll be using that wall texture for the building walls and the ortho image for the roof. And the third output that I want is to filter data to get point features of trees and replace them with instances of a 3D tree model. So in a particular park, I think I had selected Granville Loop Park, I'm going to change the tree points into 3D models, the same instance or different instances of the same definition of a model. So with that, we're going to head into the workspace. So once again, I'm gonna go over the inputs and the outputs first, and then I'm going to go through this bookmark by bookmark to show what we're achieving. Um, I've also got targeted inspectors in my workspace so I can view outputs at strategic places. So starting off, I've got my outlines, building outlines in DWG, my point cloud right up here. Scrolling down to this green bookmark, I've got my point cloud again, and my SketchUp tree model. And usually I really personally just like to have all my readers on the left side here, but it made sense for me to have my textures on in this yellow bookmark. So I've got my JPEG of the wall texture and the GeoTIFF. So let's start off in the first bookmark. I think I'm going to use the zoom feature. There we go. In this blue bookmark here, what is happening is, I'm gonna select this while I'm waiting. What's happening is that we're taking the building outlines and we're taking the point cloud and we're extruding the building outline to the height of the point cloud. And in this workspace, some of the bookmarks are, in, are collapsed. And what's happening in those ones is that we're getting the base height of the building from the terrain all the way to the top of the building to get the actual height of the building itself. Turning all of these off and I want to see extruded buildings and tin surface extruded buildings. And this is just in the visual preview here, so I'll make that a little bit bigger. So at this point, at the end of this blue bookmark, what we've got is, is our 3D buildings and terrain. So that's well and exciting, but we could do more with this. We will head into our next bookmark. In this green bookmark here, what's happening is that we're adding the ortho photo terrain appearance to the terrain. And that's something you've already seen both Kaylin and Richard do. And this is just using an appearance setter. Next, we are separating the walls from the roofs. We want these different surfaces so we can apply different textures to them. So out of this output, What's important is test filter for the wall and the roof. And we're using planarity filter to separate, to make the differences between wall and roof. In this yellow bookmark, we're finally applying the wall texture and the ortho photo. And once again, we're just using the appearance setter and an extra clipper in order to make sure that those images are fitting within those building footprints or building outlines. And we can take a look at the wall texture and the roof texture. As you see, when I select in one of them, it gives me all of them that I have on my canvas. Roof texture, wall texture. Take a closer look. So in this case, I did apply the same texture to all of the buildings, but you could take this a lot farther and say, for buildings of this height threshold, I want to use this texture, or for every fifth building that comes through. I wanna use this texture and you can vary it up a little bit and have smaller buildings with maybe more house-like textures. So you can see some of the greenery on 
some of these buildings, as well as the wall texture. Just making that small again. And then finally, the last bookmark here, what we're doing is, and I'd like to zoom in a little bit farther, what we're doing is taking the point cloud and the SketchUp tree. And there's an article in the community for getting boundary features. They're not the exact tree points. They're kind of interpolated from kind of stands of trees and then having a center point replacer in order to get sort of a visualization of what that area looks like. And we're replacing those points in the Granville Loop Park. And I did five for a maximum just for this demo and writing out to GeoDatabase as a multi-patch. So I had said I was gonna talk about the readers and the writers. In this particular instance, at the end of really any transformer here, the data is ready to write out. I did see a question about the point cloud combiner and whether that data was kind of virtual or if like that's ready to write out. And it is data that's transformed and ready to write into the format you need, so long as that target format supports it. And I have zoomed in very close. Let's go back to four. So the outputs in this particular workspace are to Cesium and to File Geodatabase. It really could be either. And I just wanted to show that you could integrate different sources and then write out to multiple formats at the same time. So this is my Cesium writer. And in this particular workspace, I'm just writing my buildings and my, yeah, my buildings to Cesium. So we can go take a look there. I have my node server turned on and we're going to head into Cesium. I'll just rerun that. So as you can see, we have our 3D buildings and the wall textures as well as the roof textures. And of course I could take this a step farther to make sure it's actually on the earth, but this is what we've got here in Cesium. So with that, I will head back into the slides. And that was just a quick screenshot. So the workspace highlights. I had mentioned that there was an article for the tree instances. There's also some how-to articles on building um, 3D buildings using point cloud and vector building outlines, as well as for um, getting a boundary feature from point cloud. So there is an article on creating if you don't have that vector layer that you could create the buildings, they just don't look quite as clean and snappy. But something that you could try out. Some tips and tricks on the methods for working with LiDAR are its similarities to raster processing. Um, you're able to tile large data sets similar to rasters and just work through those in chunks, as Richard had said. And you can use feature caching strategically. So in my particular workspace, I've turned off feature caching, but there are instances when a transformer or a process is quite computationally expensive that you might wanna just run that one time and have it cached so you can use it again later without running it again and again. And what we recommend for that is to use a junction. So if you're not sure, it does take a little bit more knowledge to know what transformers are computationally expensive or perhaps are affected by or work differently during runtime and that it stores something kind of temporarily that changes each time it's run. So just kind of for best practice, you can add a junction after to the point, after the point that you want to be able to view, and then you can view that junction each time. Secondly, knowing how FME works with point clouds is really important. I think we've touched on this a little bit already, that FME is a geometry in a, oh, sorry, FME is not a geometry. Point clouds are a geometry in FME, and they're considered a single entity. So you gotta look at what format you're writing to, such as if it's a shape file and you're writing a point cloud to a shape file that doesn't support point clouds, it's going to write out a boundary polygon of the LiDAR extent. So be sure to know that um, we have transformers to coerce it to the correct geometry, such as multi-points or to a surface or to a raster, and that you're looking at what the target format requires. Um, lastly, kind of jumping backwards, there's lots of operations that are point cloud specific, such as working with attributes versus components. So check out the point cloud transformers and make sure you're using kind of the correct tools for it, um, such as the attribute manager will manage attributes and then point cloud transformers can work with components. 
Tips and tricks for transformers. In the 3D geometry department, you've kind of already seen some of the surface creators from Richard. There's the, I've used the tin generator, which creates the surface models or the buildings. And the extruder was actually the one that created the buildings. Applying textures. I used the appearance setter to add texture image textures. And Richard had mentioned as well about the texture mapping type parameter. So do pay attention to that. With that, I will hand this back to Kaylin. OK, awesome. So this brings us to our final step of expanding your tool set with the FME Hub and third party tools. So here I just chose a few different uh, point cloud transformers from the FME Hub to highlight, and we're going to just walk through them. So if you can recall, I did uh, demonstrate the point cloud thinner, so our in-house thinner. And this one's a little bit different. The hint's kind of in the name, where it has a spatial. And so it's a bit more spatially advanced than our in-house thinner, which if you remember, samples points on an interval or by set. So our in-house thinner is more or less like a glorified sampler. And so the spatial thinner is a little different where it makes sure that two points can exist in the same interval or cell, so that they have to be a certain distance or resolution apart. Um, and so this is really good if you're doing something where you need more control over your points. For example, if you're filtering data before generating a raster DEM, um, you can set the thinning resolution to be the same as the raster cell size. If you wanted to keep it with in-house transformers and you didn't want to use the spatial thinner, we also have the point cloud simplifier, which is a little bit more geometrically advanced. Um, and it does thinning, but it aims to preserve the original shape of the point cloud through the use of different algorithms and transformations. I don't recall what algorithms we uh, kind of have built in there, but it is in our documentation if you wanted to take a look. And so this top uh, point cloud is our original, and then the bottom one is the thin. And so here I have thinned this at 0 0.25 uh, resolution. And the colors of the point cloud are different. So we color point clouds um, between this top one and the bottom one. Uh, between a range of lowest blue and then the highest values being red. And these are typically pulled from the point cloud header. So here we can see they're being uh, recolored because we're actually changing the amount of points. So we're changing the range at which um, the values are. <clears throat> so from here, I'm going to jump into uh, FME Workbench and I'm going to show you just the difference at running at a 0.3 resolution. So when we're running it at a 0.25, which you can see that's the only parameter we have, um, we can see about three, uh, 350,000 removed. And then if we run it at 0.3, my plan originally was to walk through this with you guys. Um, I was just a little bit hesitant uh, for rendering. We can see another about 40 to 30 to 40,000 points removed. And we can check this out by going here. So we can just see that we have this many points and then that's 0 0.25. So you'll notice in my screen, in my uh, slide here, this is a teal color. And then in my workspace, this is a green color. And so that's the difference between a embedded and a link transformer. So all I've done is gone ahead and uh, embedded the transformer. So if you right click, you should see an, right under edit, it should say embed um, and then this will allow you to actually open it up right in your workbench. So here we can see kind of behind the scenes what this is doing. You can see it groups by the cell. So that's how they kind of maintain the resolution. And then they just have a point cloud merger to kind of reset all the components and rebuild everything. And we can hop back into workbench, or sorry, the slides. So the next, uh, the next FME hub transformer is the point cloud stats rasterizer. And this replaces a point cloud with a one band raster. So you can input a point cloud and then you're resulting a band zero raster. And so really what this does is it stores all the statistics and all the information from your point cloud and it stores it onto the raster directly. And so we're gonna walk through a demo. This is good when you're kind of newer to working with point clouds and rasters and you're looking for that easy kind of transition between formats. Um, and so what I did here is I just added a raster palette to kind of give it a nicer look. Um, and so again, I was going to walk through this and build this with you guys. Uh, but again, for rendering, I wasn't willing to risk it. So this says an XYZ point cloud. It was a LAS. I just converted it for something different. And then we're going to go through the stats rasterizer. I left all parameters as default. Again, depending on what data you're using, you may need to change these. 
And so from here, we can inspect this cache and we can see this is our resulting raster. So if you wanted to kind of do some uh, raster processing on this further, we do have other resources that we can uh, link out. And so all we're doing here is we're, uh, we're coercing the type to be UN8 so that it can support a raster palette. And then we're using the attribute file reader to grab the palette and it's being stored in file contents. <clears throat> kind of just looks like a whole bunch of nothing, nothing, but I can actually show you the palette itself. Um, so this is all the palette is. It's just taking RGB values. And then these are just um, HTML RGB color codes. And I'm probably gonna have to close that. And then we're using the raster palette adder to add it to the palette. And you can see that this is our resulting raster. And the palette should be, the palette, yeah, should show up down there. The last uh, FME hub transformers or tools I'm gonna go over is the last tools. So the last tools is a collection of highly efficient batch scriptable multi-core uh, command line tools. And so they have tools to classify, tile, convert, filter, raster, triangulate, polygonize. Um, they have a lot of tools. And so these tools are meant for high speed, low memory, seamless processing for point cloud data. And here I'm gonna run through this uh, this workflow and I'm gonna set you up to use last classify, but I'm not going to run it myself. <clears throat> um, and so we can start out with last ground. So first things first with any workflow, we're just gonna read in our data. And I've assigned a coordinate system. So this is coming from the city of Coquitlam and uh, it's a UTM 83. And so if you notice in the uh, data inspector, we have the classification already set as a component. And so that's something that we're gonna wanna remove because we're gonna wanna reclassify it ourselves. So typically if you're downloading city data, it's likely a, will have already gone through the noise removal and classification process. Then those are some things to keep in mind. So to remove the classification, we can add a point cloud component remover. Um, you just select the classification as the component to remove. And then after your output should not have a classification component. Um, this is also comes in handy if you're merging two different rasters or point cloud, sorry, with um, different classifications, perhaps for the same area. So you could remove the classification of one and then merge and reclassify the other half. So from here, now we can jump into last ground. So last ground is a tool for bare earth extraction or identification, and it pretty much classifies LiDAR points into ground points as a class two. You'll see here, I changed the horizontal and vertical units from feet to meters because of our coordinate system. So that's something to keep in mind. And then you can see after running this tool, all the ground points are classified as two. So last tools is a suite of transformers that needs to be run in a particular order. And running last height kind of requires that ground points have already been classified. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so this assumes that ground points have already been uh, classified as ground points and now they can be identified to construct the tin, which is how they uh, do the math of height above ground. So by default, the resulting heights are quantified, as you can see. Uh, you can store these as a in user data, or you can store it as a component. For the screenshots, I stored it as a component just so I could quickly show you guys. Um, and yeah, so now after running this, now that you have your last grounds, you have your ground points, and then you have everything set up for your tin, you can go ahead and run your class of last classify. Some um, some tips and tricks, definitely run with feature caching off if you can. I know that makes it a little bit harder to compare your results. Um, also, if possible, try running these tools from the command line. I think it, it's a little more seamless that way. And if you are running into these errors when you're running uh, your tools and you're kind of at a loss, try purging your temp folder. That's something I found uh, that worked. I ended up having to purge after every tool when running with feature caching. And I also decided that if you shorten the path, you kind of get a little bit quicker results. I used to have a crazy long user path in here and shortening it up kind of improved performance a little bit for me. Okay, I think Richard is going to wrap us up. Okay. 
Thanks, Kaylin. So to wrap things up here, we want to just talk about, uh, reiterate the fact that when you're authoring your workflow or you're pushing it up to, to production, that there's different ways to deal with your data, clipping it, thinning it, um, using the feature caching or not. And there's a lot of tools to make it really accessible and usable by the user, and you don't have to worry about it. When we're looking at uh, our LiDAR data, this is just a recap of everything we went through. We went through a lot of transformers, and I, I really wanted to focus on the fact that it can get complex and it can get detailed and nuanced, but you can also just use a few transformers to get more value out of it. It's very easy to get started with your LiDAR data. There's also a good use case for FME just being able to prepare your data, to clean it up, to thin it out, to make it usable from other applications. We also want to highlight how FME Server, uh, part of the whole platform, can take these workflows and really speed them up or automate them or allow you to do self-serve options. Uh, lastly, there are, there's visualization of surface models and city modeling uh, that can really help add value to your data. And lastly, FME includes these third-party tool set, the last tools, which can provide a lot of detail and a whole new range of tools for you to use. So you can get deep dives into your uh, point cloud data uh, if, if you're interested. Awesome. So this morning we experienced some technical issues on our end and um, thank you so much for your patience. And we do have a community badge for everyone. And you can claim your badge at fme.ly slash webinar barge. And today code is on the screen and I will leave it in the chat as well. So we have some time for Q&A and I will pass it over to our presenters. So are there any questions that we may want to address live? Hi, Hannah. We got a lot of great questions today in the chat. Um, sorry again for the technical issues in the beginning. The recordings will be sent out afterwards, so you can check that out if you missed anything in the beginning. So kind of starting with some of the questions that we got. Um, one of the first ones was whether we can analyze point density. And yes, you can certainly do that. Um, from the feature information window itself, it gives you kind of the total number of points in a point cloud. So if you were to split out your point cloud, you could check the different number of points. If you wanted to go further into it, um, you could create um, solids or areas that you clip to. So if you were to course your point cloud into individual points, and then you wanted to check in a certain area how many points there are, you can do that as well. Did I miss anything there, Kaylin? Check marks, you're good. <laughs> There's the another next... one here. Oh, Go ahead. sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, can we drape ortho photos on top of building footprints? So I think you can use a point cloud on raster components that are to overlay like geotypes on uh, point clouds and stuff like that. I think adding on to that, I personally really like the surface draper. It's got a couple of different ports to input, and one of them can be the ortho photo, and it just drapes it on top of a surface. Um, though I wasn't too sure what foot springs were, so if you wanted to come on the chat and let us know kind of any more details on that, I was sort of assuming they were like footprints. Yeah, that's what I thought too, footprints. Okay. Um, there was a short question about whether the TIN was in a CAD or a GIS format. If I recall correctly from the TIN generator, that output port of a TIN surface, you can write it out to a CAD writer or a GIS writer. So that kind of depends on what your output is. And as long as that format supports that geometry. There was a really cool question that I think stumped actually both Kaylin and I in the background. It was about asking um, whether they can clean up classification errors, such as solo points that have no points in the same classification nearby, so to remove those class outliers. So I don't think FME has anything really built in to be able to do that. Um, there are some things that I can sort of think of, but won't be easily automated across different point clouds. There are better programs to be able to post-process your point cloud or to 
kind of clean up those sort of classification errors. Um, some things that I can think of are to make use of buffers. So if you were to, for example, split up your point cloud into these different classes, you could visually check whether you have just something way out in the distance that doesn't belong there, or you could use buffers or um, the, the box accumulator. Kaylin, do you remember what that one's called? The bounding box accumulator? Yes, thank you. That one exactly. So those are kind of some ideas you can work with. You might want to check in the community to see if anyone else has tackled something similar. So that'd be a really great question to post, but I don't really know off the top of my head. I actually did take a look in the community and it looks like people use a combination of the point cloud stats calculator and point cloud filter to do that. Well, that's really smart. I was also kind of thinking like perhaps something in data analytics you could check for like, I don't remember the exact statistical terms, but just the differences in the outlying. So cool question. Were there any other ones you noticed, Kaylin? I think you had the main one. There's one question here um, about whether you can transfer a component from one point cloud to another. Oop, I need to make this wider. Let me see. One point cloud to another from the same area, like a nearest neighbor, for example, transfer the color from a dense matching imaging PC to the aerial LiDAR PC that has no color. That's a good question. Go from one point cloud to another. I feel like it would be possible. I'm not too sure about an exact answer right now. Possibly another one for the community. But Kaylin, do you have any ideas on that one? I don't think so off the top of my head. That's a good one. I, I'm not too sure. Sorry, guys. And then, wow, lots of questions coming in. Feel free to pull any ones out if you are interested in talking about them. This is kind of an interesting, a uh, good one. If extracting from a website that contains last data sets, can you run analysis by grabbing them instead of downloading them? It looks like in our reader, we do have an option to select file from the web and specify a URL. So I think you can grab them instead of downloading them. Yeah, definitely worth a try. There was another question on wanting to set the inspector to color the point cloud for different components like intensity, classification, or Z values. Would this be possible without splitting the point cloud or transforming to a numeric raster? I think, Kaylin, you had answered that. Did you want to tackle this one first? I, I feel like it would be good to try it, but uh, you might be able to get away with a point cloud component setter and using like a feature color setter. There might be a more graceful way to do it, but that's what came to mind. Yeah, I think it, it would definitely be a built solution as opposed to something you can do immediately in the inspector. Um, I've seen some really cool things go by in the hub at the FME hub where community members create things and share them, whether those are templates or um, custom transformers, one of them being the point cloud HSV color setter. There's one that I could think of, I think Dimitri created, that colors your point cloud by elevation. I've also seen some really cool solutions in the community by Takashi on coloring based on elevations as well, but kind of selecting your elevations. So that might be one that you want to check out. And if we have time at the end of this webinar, I'll take a look for it and chat that out if I can find it. But yeah, that's what I can think of in that one. Most of these um, workspaces also are available. I've just chatted out the old recording link, so they should be available through there. I am also just tracking the formats matrix right now. Somebody asked about our integration with Recap. And I remember we have one form, like we have a reader or a writer. I think it was just a reader. Recap. Write only. So we can write to Autodesk Recap. I think it is aimed to be deprecated for the future. So it still works in the version that it's available in, but I think for something like 2022, it's no longer available. So you'll just need to use an older version, but you can definitely write to Autodesk Recap and it'll still be supported.
and thank you to here. Yeah, that was about building footprints, our question about foot springs. Um, I see a comment about last tools being not free. I'm actually not too sure about that, but I can follow up with you after the webinar. I think I recall they had a licensing model and it was like free up to a certain number of points. So that's definitely good to check. Do check out their website. They have some kind of licensing model and pricing there. I think that came up in the previous webinar as well. So I think that might be it for now. We'll be online for the next few. So we'll keep answering questions and we can send that to all so everyone can see that. But if you have any further questions that we didn't get to, we will follow up with you. And thank you so much for attending the webinar today. Yeah, so I think I can wrap us up. So we have our 2022 user conference coming in August and you can assess the link to register in the chat. And we also have a lot of upcoming and on-demand webinars on our website. So uh, make sure to check that out at uh, safe.com slash webinars. Yep, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined our webinar today and also to our presenters. Um, after the webinar, there's a survey and we always love to see what content you're interested in and how we can improve our webinars. And for that, I will leave the webinar open for a few minutes longer, just in case you have any question or if you want to save any links from the chat. And all the resources to this webinar will be available on our website later today. Uh, if we're not able to answer your question during the webinars, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you with an email. So I think that's it for uh, our webinar today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much for attending.